Welcome to Flashback Friday! Hi, welcome to the Silver Spleen. My name is Stretch Armstrong, and this is my review of Long Arm of the Law. One, two, and three. In 1984, Britain signed the Joint Declaration with the People's Republic of China, promising to leave Hong Kong on July 1st, 1997. Long Arm of the Law was released in 1984, and while it doesn't explicitly deal with the handover, it implicitly addresses some of the issues surrounding it. Big circle gangs were made up of people including former PLA soldiers and other social and political refugees from mainland China. They often came to Hong Kong to carry out robberies in banks and jewelry stores with military precision and shocking violence. Long Arm of the Law tells the story of one such gang. They intend to rob a jewelry store and return to China with enough money to last them the rest of their lives. But things don't go as planned. When they arrive at their target, someone else is already robbing it, badly. The police at the scene notice them. And then everything just gets worse from then on. Long Arm of the Law is one of those really rare movies for me. It's entertaining as a story, it's a very well-made film, and it serves as an excellent snapshot of a place and time. David Lamwai plays Tung, the leader of the gang. He's the most well-known actor of the group. The others aren't so familiar, and it makes it easier to see the characters and not the actors. The cinematography is inventive and effective, showing us the story in ways that capture and amplify the settings and characters. A lot of the credit for that should probably go to Philip Chan, a former police officer who wrote this movie and appears in it on a television screen. See if you can find him. From what I could tell, all of the scenes in Long Arm of the Law take place in real settings, like jewelry stores, the Kowloon City Mall, as well as the now demolished Kowloon Walled City. In the opening of the film, as the gang tries to sneak into Hong Kong, they're chased by police dogs. I assume that in 1984, the Hong Kong film industry didn't have animal trainers or trained movie animals. Because as far as I know, they don't have them now. It looks like the filmmakers got some help from the police and their dogs. And the dogs are really convincing. <laughs> Later in the film, David Lamwai almost gets run over by a car whether intentionally or as the result of a misstep while he was doing the scene. Either way, it looks real because it is real. Near the end of the film, a car full of people is set on fire. In order to film this, they set fire to a car full of people. The sense of realism isn't just in what we see on the screen. It's also present in what the film wants us to think and to feel. There's a very profound sense of moral ambiguity at work in this movie. The portrayal of the protagonists changes over the course of the film. It turns out that the good guys aren't all so good. But then again, the bad guys aren't all bad either. By the end of the movie, nobody can claim the moral high ground. I really like moral ambiguity in movies. One of the most valuable things about Long Arm of the Law is the way it captures the Hong Kong of 1984 both visually and emotionally. The clothing and the taxis and the stores give us a glimpse of what the city was like because it changes so much and so fast. I learned a lot from this movie. I had no idea there was a Chuck E. Cheese in Kowloon City Mall or an ice rink. I don't care if it was fashionable then. Anybody in a tight pink sweatsuit deserves whatever happens to them. Early in the film, the gang makes offerings to a fallen comrade. The choice of offerings says a lot about what life was like in China at the time, as well as the nature of life in Hong Kong. We also get to see what might be the first appearance in a Hong Kong film of the double pistol and the so-called Mexican standoff. So when Tarantino says that he didn't steal them from Ringo Lam, he's not lying, sort of. Long Arm of the Law is a classic film. While it shows its age, it also ages really, really well, which not many films seem to be able to do. It's an entertaining film, but it's also very affecting. I don't think anybody could watch that film all the way to the end and not be emotionally affected. It was commercially and critically popular enough that a sequel was released in 1987. Whereas Johnny Mac directed the first film, his brother Michael directed Long Arm of the Law Saga 2. It's written by Choi Hawk, and it tells the story of three illegal immigrants forced to work undercover as big circle gang members. The gangs have become a big problem for the police, and we know this because part two opens with two police officers watching a montage of footage from part one. 
Elvis Choi plays Li, a former Chinese police officer who fled to Hong Kong for political reasons. A number of people from the first film also appear in part two, but as different characters. Ben Lam, who had a bit part in the first film as a police officer, plays Li's friend Chick. The group of undercovers are led by Biggie, played by Alex Mann. The segment of the film where he helps these new immigrants adjust to life in Hong Kong, as well as life in the underworld as undercovers, is one of the best things about the film. It really adds depth to the characters. Pauline Wong plays a woman who um, makes her living with her feet in the air. While this movie isn't in the same league as the first one, it still has a lot going for it. Elvis Choi turns in a very commendable performance carrying the movie. The action is intense and well done and has an almost visceral impact, especially a torture scene that makes me uncomfortable just thinking about it. It's brutal and it's ugly and it's horrifying, but I'm pretty sure that that's what Choi Hawk wanted it to be. A scene set in the old airport at Kai Tak lets us see what that airport looked like, and the action in the scene is obviously worth watching too. Like the first film, part two is essentially bleak, but also very emotionally affecting. The end of the film is classic, from the gunplay, to the camera work, to the ideas that motivate the characters and their actions. Part two isn't the landmark film that its predecessor was, but it's still an interesting and entertaining film. It did well enough that two years later, in 1989, a third installment was released. Long Arm of the Law 3 was written by Johnny Mac and again directed by his brother Michael. It stars Andy Lau as Lee Chung Kong and Max Mock as Chicken Heart, illegal immigrants who end up working for a local gangster. Andy's only doing it to buy the freedom of Amun, a woman he met on the way to Hong Kong and is now deeply in love with. Hey, it's a movie. I don't write them, I just watch them. Returning to the series is Elvis Choi, again playing a mainland cop, but this time he's the bad guy. He's pursuing Andy Lau, and he doesn't care who or what gets in his way. He comes off like a communist robocop with a couple of crossed wires, but he's got a big knife and a Norinko knockoff Desert Eagle, so he's at least fun to watch. There are several scenes in which his character plays the catalyst for people's feelings about 1997 and the impending handover, so the film at least touches on politics, although not very subtly. Speaking of which, any movie with a photo doctored to put Elvis Choi next to Deng Xiaoping gets 50,000 bonus points. The pacing in part three is often frantic, the action is loud, and all the classic details are there. Pouty young Andy Lau, synthesizer soundtrack, overstated bad guys, guns with bottomless magazines, and more fun than you should be allowed to have with the kind of budget this film was probably working with. I should also point out that the young Andy Lau was really good at doing physical stuff. His stunts and fights weren't always doubled, and you can see that he's doing a lot of it himself. Though, to be fair, not all of his action is convincing. Um, you're doing it wrong. Besides, once you've seen the new territories used as a substitute for the nation of Panama, what else is there? Part 4, more commonly known as Underground Express, also stars Elvis Choi. There's a link to my review of that movie, at the end of this review, because this one's gotten long enough. In the description, there are links where you can buy these movies. That would be a good thing, because then you get much better resolution, and you can freeze frame it, and you can watch the extras. Watching movies online, you can't. If you enjoyed this review, please leave me a comment. If you didn't enjoy the review, leave me a comment. If you enjoy the channel, please subscribe so that you can see all the new videos as soon as they're released.